In a prior video in this module, we looked at how the position of equilibrium would shift as a function of a change in the reaction conditions, and in particular, a change in pressure. Now I want to consider a different reaction condition that you could change, the temperature, and I want to look at how the equilibrium constant depends on temperature. So in order to do that, let's take advantage once more of the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. So again, I'll refer you back to video 8.7 if you want to see that in its original form. But I'm going to substitute in for a delta G quantity the relationship to the equilibrium constant. Right? And so in particular, I will get then that partial log of the equilibrium constant partial T is equal to d log kp dt, because it only depends on t. So this is just a recognition that the equilibrium constant depends only on temperature, so I can write it as a normal derivative, not a partial derivative. And keeping track of the, uh, the factor of r that was over here, I will end up with the enthalpy of reaction divided by rt squared. And that's known as the Van Hoff equation. So what it says is that for an endothermic reaction, so endothermic means that delta H of reaction is a positive number. So that's written here, delta H is positive. I would expect Kp to increase with T. Meanwhile, an exothermic reaction, if this is a negative number, the enthalpy of reaction, then the equilibrium constant would be expected to decrease with T. And this is another manifestation of Le Chatelier's principle, right? that a reaction responds to a change, and if a temperature is raised, you go in the direction of the higher energy products, so endothermic reaction, you're providing heat, that's why the temperature is going up essentially, and as a result, you're driving things towards those higher enthalpy products. On the other hand, if you decrease the temperature and you're pulling heat out, the opposite will be true. We can also integrate the Van Hoff equation. So that last uh, evaluation effectively involved considering change in the log with respect to a change in temperature. Now let me move dt over onto the other side and integrate. And I'll get an integral of d log will give me log of one minus log of the other, so log of a ratio. And then I need to do the integral from t1 to t2 of enthalpy of reaction divided by rt squared dt. Over small temperature ranges, when I solve that integral, and I get one over t minus one over t actually as the result, and I plug in the limits, then I get something that looks uh, very like the clausius clapeyron equation. And so if you remember back in video 9.6, we did something relatively similar where we found that the log of pressure changes for a pure substance was related to a vaporization enthalpy, so a change in enthalpy from one phase to another divided by R times the difference in the, dif in the inverse temperatures. Exactly the same sort of mathematical formalism has happened here, except that we're using the equilibrium constant as our uh, representer of free energy. And so if you plot a, for a given chemical reaction, here we have uh, the water gas shift reaction is the name of this reaction. It's actually very important industrially for uh, working with hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide. So if I plot the log of the equilibrium constant against 1 over t, in this case it's actually 1,000 Kelvin over t, what I find is that it is linear in 1 over t as it should be. When I look at this equation, it's got to be linear in 1 over t. And the actual slope is going to be the prefactor here. So if, if it's not obvious that it should be linear, think about the fact that Here's 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. 
So what is a line? It is something varying as a constant times the variable minus a different value of the variable. So here's 1 over t. Um, so this slope minus enthalpy of reaction over r is how you can determine the enthalpy of reaction, actually, by looking at the equilibrium constant. That is, I would change the temperature. I'd measure the partial pressures of these gases. That allows me to compute the equilibrium constant, plot them as a function of temperature, do the best fit line to that plot, and that gives me the enthalpy of reaction. And so in this particular case, we're going from 900 Celsius, that is one hot reactor, to 600 Celsius, which is still one seriously hot reactor. And now, given that, I'd like you to uh, answer the question, is the water gas shift reaction, as it's written below, exothermic? or endothermic? And so the answer is endothermic, and you can take a look at the explanation, and then we'll move on. Now, in the last uh, slide where we derived the Van't Hoff equation, we made one approximation to make life a little simpler, and that was to assume that the enthalpy of reaction was a constant over the range we were looking at. And in the water gas shift reaction example, it actually looked pretty good. The, the line we plotted as a function of 1 over t looked very linear. However, delta H of reaction is itself a function of t. So in principle, it might not be nearly constant over a temperature range one is interested in. Of course, it's not too hard to deal with that if that's truly the case. One would uh, rearrange this expression to be log of the equilibrium constant at a given temperature, T2. It looks like, uh, okay, we had a 2 over here and now the 2 is missing. But the final temperature is equal to log of the equilibrium constant at T1 plus the integral from T1 to to T2 of, including still with its full temperature dependence, the enthalpy. And you'll find that you would get a, when would this be important? When the plot is no longer linear. So here's a good example of plotting log of the equilibrium constant against 1 over T for another terrifically important reaction, uh, hydrogen and nitrogen reacting to make ammonia. So this reaction actually consumes 1% of all energy use on the planet. And if you wonder, what do people do with all that ammonia? Uh, that's fertilizer. So that is injected into the ground so that plants have a source of nitrogen, and we feed a very large planetary population. So it's an amazing thing that we put that much energy into it. But in any case, uh, coming back to the, the uh, actual data, so the data shown here are the curved line, the solid curved line. Had we assumed delta H reaction to be a constant, you would have gotten this dotted straight line. That's the Van't Hoff line. But we know what we can do in that instance, right? If, if delta H is not a constant, what is it equal to? Well, delta H at T2 is delta H at T1 plus the integral from T1 to T2 of the heat capacity. And so heat capacity is often tabulated as some function of temperature. And so what one could do is that one could insert and solve in this integral. Now with a polynomial in t, you'd expand out to get a whole bunch of different integrals in minus 2 power of t, minus 1 power of t, 0 power of t. And one would be able to get a better fit to this were that to be interesting. And given how important this reaction is, needless to say, that is available for uh, hydrogen and nitrogen reacting to make ammonia. All right. So that is the Van't Hoff equation used to understand temperature dependence of equilibrium constants and also to measure enthalpies of reaction. Next, we're going to look at determining the equilibrium constant from Q. And in this case, it's the other Q.